My name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google since 2005. And I'm sure I know many of you and uh, many of you must know me. I've been around for quite a long time now, uh, having started working on computer networking with the ARPANET project way back in 1969 when I was still a graduate student at UCLA. Lots of things have happened in between. And in particular, uh, an aspiration began in 1998 to develop a solar system-wide internet. And that's what this talk is all about. So let's, uh, let's uh, start out just by reminding you that uh, the first demonstration of the internet capability, uh, the serious demonstration came in 1977 when I was at ARPA running the program as a program manager and wanted very much to show by demonstration that the TCP IP protocols would actually work uh, with different kinds of packet switch networks, with different data rates, different uh, you know, packet sizes, different latency, different error rates. And uh, so this uh, diagram shows you what we did in November of 77. We had a mobile packet radio van driving up and down the Bayshore Freeway uh, in a packet radio network system that was operated by SRI International. Uh, that van was radiating packets that went through a gateway into the ARPANET, which went all the way across the U.S. and the Atlantic through an internal satellite hop to Norway and then a landline down to University College London, uh, at which point it popped out of the ARPANET in the U.K., went through a gateway uh, at, the, at UCL and then to a ground station at Goonhilly Downs and up across the packet satellite network to ETAM, West Virginia, where there was another ground station and then popped out into another gateway and then uh, all the way across the country uh, to USC Information Sciences Institute in Marina del Rey, California. So the packet radio van and, and Marina del Rey are about 400 miles apart. Uh, so the packets that were going uh, across the Atlantic and across the US and back and forth uh, to Europe, I went about 100,000 miles because they were going through two synchronous satellite hops, which you will remember is like 22,000 miles up and down. That's 44 times two is 88, plus back and forth across the uh, the U.S. and the Atlantic. So we're talking about 100,000 miles, and it actually worked. And I remember, you know, leaping up and down in my office in, in the D.C. area, you know, saying it works, it works, you know, like it couldn't possibly have worked. Um, and that's because it's software and it's always a miracle when software works. So this for me was a very important date demonstrating that the internet protocols, which had begun as an idea in 1973 when Bob Kahn and I began thinking about this to the point where we had a practical demonstration. And then another four or five years went by as we implemented these protocols on every operating system we could get our hands on. So that was a very important uh, milestone. And then, of course, we look at the Internet today, and what we see are hundreds of thousands of networks, including the ones that operate in your homes uh, and offices, uh, like the one I'm using right now, which is uh, a nice six or 700 megabit uh, connection uh, to, uh, to the uh, Internet backbone. What I intended to show with this chart, which is actually fairly old, it was done in 1999, and it's, it's a rendering of the uh, border gateway protocol backbone routing forwarding tables. The point about the different colors is that there are literally hundreds of thousands of networks that are operating each independently of each other, uh, each of them with whatever software and hardware the operators choose whatever business model they choose, and whoever they want to connect to is their negotiation on a pairwise basis. Um, so this is highly distributed. There is no central control. The only thing that's central in this system is the operation of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is responsible for making sure that IP address space and domain name uh, assignments are done uh, on a unique basis so we don't assign the same IP address to two different networks or the same domain name to two different uh, operators. But that's the only element of coordination in the system. Otherwise, it's highly distributed. So this has turned out to be a very powerful tool. Uh, we've seen all the benefits and some of the harmful uh, difficulties with misinformation and disinformation. The question, though, is uh, could we do something like that in space? So in 1997, uh, some of you will recall 
that the Pathfinder uh, robot was landed on Mars successfully after a 20 year gap because in 1976, two Viking landers arrived on Mars, sent by uh, uh, NASA. Uh, and then for 20 years, nothing worked. You know, things didn't make it to the planet or they crashed and all kinds of other bad things happened until 97 when the Pathfinder arrived. And so uh, shortly thereafter, I met with a team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and we began talking about what we should be thinking of doing that would be important and necessary 25 years later. So we were thinking 2023 uh, or thereabouts, uh, way back in 1998. And our conclusion was, why don't we think about building a network that could operate across the entire solar system in order to provide communications capability for both manned and robotic spacecraft? So that is what launched us into a discussion about interplanetary networking. Uh, there were a number of spacecraft that came after the Sojourner uh, and Pathfinder uh, uh, in initiative in 97. And the most important one uh, following that was the arrival of Spirit and Opportunity uh, on Mars in January of 2004. Those two spacecraft were intended to transmit data directly back to Earth to what's called the Deep Space Network. These are three 70 meter dishes that are located at, uh, uh, in Australia, in Spain, and in California. Uh, so that even as the Earth turns, we have this big, these big antennas that can look out into the solar system and communicate with various spacecraft. So that was the plan. The data rate that would have been available for the direct to Earth path from the surface of Mars back to the Deep Space Network was about 28 kilobits a second which left the scientists a little grumpy. Uh, then when we actually started transmitting data uh, using that system, uh, we noticed that the radios were overheating. And so that led the engineers to say we should back off on the duty cycle. And of course that made the scientists even more grumpy. But then uh, it was noticed uh, or pointed out by one of the engineers at JPL that there was a, a, another radio on board that could communicate directly with the orbiters that had been sent to Mars beforehand in order to map the surface of Mars, in order to figure out where the rover should go. So they were still in orbit and they were still, they had power, they had programmable capability, they had computing, um, they had communications. And so uh, we uploaded, the JPL team uploaded a uh, sort of prototype store and forward software package in order to hold the data in the uh, rovers that they had collected until an orbiter got overhead. And they'd squirt the data up to the orbiter and it would hang on to the data until it got to the right place in its orbit to transmit data back to the deep space network. Now, the good news is that because the distance between the rover on the surface and the orbiter was only a few hundred miles, uh, we could actually get better signal-to-noise ratio on that channel, and so we could transmit at 128 kilobits a second. The orbiter is out of the uh, Mars atmosphere, as thin as it is, and it has bigger uh, you know, solar power, uh, so it could transmit data back to the deep space network also at 128 kilobits a second. So we got four times more data right by going store and forward. So we were able to demonstrate the utility of packet switching uh, to the uh, space exploration community uh, by putting this prototype system together. In the meantime, we had begun developing uh, a set of protocols for uh, this interplanetary backbone. Now, uh, some people uh, might reasonably have assumed that we could use the TCP IP protocols. After all, they worked okay on Earth. They surely would work okay on Mars. But when we started doing the math, we realized that the round trip times between Earth and Mars are variable, ranging from seven minutes round trip to 40 minutes round trip. And uh, those of you who uh, are familiar with TCP will know that the uh, flow control mechanisms are pretty simple. Basically, when you think you're going to run out of room, you tell the other guy, stop. And of course, if it takes 20 minutes for the other guy to hear you say stop, while, he, while he's not hearing you say stop, he's transmitting full bore and uh, you've got traffic falling on the floor and blowing away in the wind. 
So, uh, oh, and then we had another little problem too, and that was uh, the, the planets are rotating and we didn't know how to stop that either. And so that meant if you were talking to something on the surface and the planet rotated, uh, you'd lose contact until the planet rotated back around again. And so we had a variably delayed because of the orbital considerations and disrupted environment to deal with. And TCP, as wonderful as it has been, uh, has uh, doesn't do well uh, with those kinds of variable and high delays and, uh, and frequent disruptions. So, um, oh, and we had another scenario that was also a little disturbing. Imagine for a moment that you're on Mars and you're trying to communicate with something on Earth. So you're going to do a DNS lookup. Well, okay, first of all, you don't know how long it's going to take to get an answer back. And if the packet gets lost and you have to retransmit, it could be really bad, like an hour or more. Uh, then the other problem is that because there's an increasing amount of mobility uh, in the internet environment, imagine that you did a lookup, you got an IP address, and by the time you got it, it was too late because the you know, device you wanted to talk to has moved into a different network with a different IP address. So DNS lookup in these circumstances didn't look too attractive either. And so we decided, okay, rather than trying to you know, contort the TCP IP protocols and the other uh, protocols that go with it, we said, let's just look at the design of a network that operates in a delay and disruption tolerant environment. And so we developed what's called the bundled protocol. Again, it's like the internet space. It's a layered architecture. Uh, first thing uh, we did was re with regard to name resolution was to have a two-step resolution. The first one is which planet are you going to? You know, how do I get to that planet? And after I get a packet to land on the right planet, or the right spacecraft if it's in transit somewhere. Uh, then, uh, then I do a second lookup to find out where is it that I'm actually going on that planetary network. So we have a two-stage name resolution mechanism. The second thing that's interesting is that because of the potential for disruption, we decided that the relay nodes in the system should actually be able to hold on to data until a link comes back up again, you know, based on the orbital uh, dynamics that might be involved. That's different from the internet where we decided if there was no forwarding link, you throw things away. That's because in the design phase back 40 years ago or more now, getting close to 50 years, uh, storing things in the net didn't look very feasible because memory was expensive. Now, 50 years later, you can put a lot more memory in the net. And so we decided to take advantage of that and allow the net to hold data so that links could come and go and the system would hold on to it until links come back up again. So, uh, so that's a different uh, architectural choice. Uh, then we started looking at how you manage a network like this. And you know, for many of us who grew up with the internet, uh, ping was our friend, right? You send a ping and you got back something in 500 milliseconds or less, and you had some idea of are you up there and are you functioning? Well, ping is not your friend in a high vari highly variable delay environment, for one thing. You don't know how long it's going to take to come back. What if it gets lost? What if it has to be retransmitted? So it's not a real-time uh, kind of mechanism at all. So we had to build in uh, a much more um, elaborate network management system, which recognizes that there isn't going to be a lot of interaction between some network management tool uh, and the system that uh, that you're trying to manage or whose data you're trying to uh, state you're trying to collect. Uh, so we had to develop a new network management system that uh, dealt with that. Uh, we also uh, noticed that in the internet environment, certainly in the early days, we didn't have a whole lot of cryptography and protecting of information or strong authentication with digital signatures. Uh, and uh, the last thing that I wanted when we were starting this project was a headline that says 15 year old takes over MarsNet. So we concluded that we should design authentication and the cryptography into the system as a fundamental part of the design. And so bundles can be encrypted, they can be digitally signed, the devices that are part of the network can authenticate each other and using digital signatures. Again, there's all kinds of registration mechanisms in order to make that work. So here's where we, where we uh, are now, or how we got where we are. In 2004, uh, I've already told you the story about putting in this uh, store and forward system in order to recover data back from the Mars rovers. 99% of all the data that has come back from all of the spacecraft that the U.S. has sent 
uh, from Mars is use the orbiters as relays, storm forward relays to gather all of the data. Um, and it, this is just a nicer picture of some of the various spacecraft that have landed. In addition to Spirit and Opportunity, there was the Mars Science Lander, there was the, what do we want to cut? The Mars Science Laboratory came after the two Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Uh, the Phoenix Lander arrived at the North Pole. And more recently, of course, Perseverance uh, just arrived successfully and even just flew Ingenuity uh, about 10 feet off the ground, which is so amazing because there isn't a hell of a lot of atmosphere for a, a helicopter to work. All of those vehicles have been using the storm forward techniques that we developed for Spirit and Opportunity. So we've been testing these protocols and evolving them over time to improve their robustness and their utility. Uh, we actually got permission to use a satellite that was uh, called the Deep Impact spacecraft uh, that was used in the epoxy mission for uh, to visit two uh, two comets. They get it, they gave us uh, permission to upload our software into this spacecraft and then test it at about 80, 81 light seconds away. Uh, then we've been testing on the International Space Station actually now well beyond 2018. We did a Metaron uh, test in order to find out whether these protocols that were designed for highly variable delay and disruption would work in real time if in fact the distances were short. And so the Metaron experiment was on board the International Space Station. The astronauts could control a small rover uh, in Germany and, and literally steer it around with a joystick, so to speak, uh, using the same protocols, but in real time because the physical delays were so short. Uh, we also did a high-speed experiment using uh, lasers, uh, bouncing a signal off of the moon and coming back uh, to Earth and then running the protocols on top of that uh, laser-based signal. We were able to get 600 megabits a second. So the important point I want to make here is that the protocols functionally span over quite a wide range of latency, disruption, and speeds. And so it's, it has a broader footprint functional footprint than TCP IP. Uh, we have been uh, doing a, a lot of work now with other uh, of the spacefaring nations uh, in Japan, at JAXA, CARI, and in Korea. Uh, we've been working with ESA, uh, with, which, uh, with whom we did the Metaron experiment, for example. Uh, we've also uh, set up a, a DTN working group in the IETF which has been standardizing the bundle protocols version six and now version seven, which we think is a stable version that we're going to use. We've also worked, uh, this team has worked with the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which is an agency of the UN where all of the spacefaring nations get together to standardize communication protocols uh, for space comms. And uh, we've standardized the bundle protocol through CCSDS as well. So we've operated in parallel with the DTM working group uh, in the IETF. Uh, there's another exciting application uh, was undertaken in, by Lulia University, which is about 60 degrees north in Sweden. Uh, the, uh, the group there is using the bundle protocols in order to track reindeer who are wandering around uh, uh, in the, uh, with the Sami reindeer herder herders, and the idea there is to use this variable connectivity uh, and opportunistic routing in order to track the uh, the reindeer as they wander around uh, in their, uh, you know, wherever it is that the reindeer go. So uh, this has been something in you know, an unusual way of uh, testing the uh, robustness of the protocols. Uh, there also are implementations um, of this protocol uh, for uh, Android, for example, or for some other uh, small uh, small uh, programmable devices, Ubiquity is another example. Um, I've already mentioned that we're working together with the other spacefaring nations on standardizing and using these protocols. The protocols have been implemented in uh, reference form and they're available, several of them from GitHub, one of which is the ION imp implementation that NASA is using for most of its work but there are several other implementations as well. And in the future, uh, what we're planning uh, is to uh, make available these uh, applications that run on top of the bundle protocols. Uh, first of all, making use of those capabilities for the return to the moon, uh, the Artemis program, 
that the U.S. has mounted, uh, and the Gateway Program, which is an international effort to put a spacecraft in an eccentric orbit to sort of act as an elevator to go from Earth to Mars, or Earth to or the Moon and back, uh, bringing space, uh, uh, bringing the uh, astronauts uh, to uh, orbit near the Moon, where they can go down uh, to a, a ground station and stay there for a while in a laboratory environment and then return. Uh, there is an organization called the Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group that was formed way back in 1998 uh, under the auspices of the Internet Society. Uh, and that group uh, is uh, bringing the interplanetary protocols on into terrestrial uh, applications, and it's pursuing four or five different paths. One of them uh, is to... Um, put these protocols into the cloud-based systems from you know, Azure and, uh, and AWS and Google. So we have the protocols now running in those various clouds. Our intent uh, is to uh, invite people to build applications for mobiles, for example, or for laptops or desktops or uh, tablets and things like that. So they can exercise the interplanetary protocols with some simple applications, maybe image lookup uh, for identification in a database. But the idea there is to uh, ask the general public to help us uh, generate a substantial amount of traffic to go through the interplanetary protocol system so that we can shake out uh, its uh, determine its robustness, fix problems along those lines. Uh, we're also very interested in making sure that all the various implementations of the bundle protocols will interwork. Some of you will remember the Interop company that was started by Dan Lynch back about 1986. Uh, it had the, uh, the feature that if you wanted to exhibit at the Interop show, you had to agree to hook up to the show net, which is a big yellow Ethernet cable system, and then demonstrate your interoperability with the other people who are on the show. We're thinking that we should... Uh, perhaps resurrect that idea so the people who are implementing different versions of the uh, bundle protocols can demonstrate their interoperability. We also have a, a kind of a DTN bone um, uh, arrangement using all of the uh, laboratory facilities at NASA plus some of the labs that are associated with others of the, um, the other spacefaring uh, space agencies uh, where we can do further testing and development of, the, of different applications intended for real use in uh, space applications. Here, what we're trying to do is to uh, increase the technology, uh, what's called TRL level, uh, technology readiness level of the protocols so that they can be uh, prepared for um, authorization for use in flight. Uh, so the IPN SIG is also looking 100 years out, uh, looking at what would it look like say 30 years from now and 100 years from now, as we see the commercialization of space, the possibility that some of the communication systems will move from uh, the uh, responsibility of the uh, space um, uh, organizations like NASA and ESA and JAXA uh, to commercial enterprise in the same way that the internet went from government-sponsored backbones like NSFNet and the ARPANET and uh, ESNet and NASA Science Internet, among others, to uh, commercial use. We're anticipating that there will be a transition period over the course of the 30 to 100 years that, where a lot of the uh, network operations will be commercial in nature and still have government networks that will interact with the system. So we're looking forward as far as we can towards the true growth of an interplanetary backbone. We're not suggesting that you should just run off and go build something and hope somebody will use it. In fact, what we're guessing is that most of the spacecraft that will use this interplanetary system uh, will um, eventually, when they finish their scientific experiments, those spacecraft could be repurposed as nodes of the interplanetary backbone. So you can imagine this sort of growing over a period of decades. Uh, mission by mission, spacecraft by spacecraft, until we have uh, nodes that are prepared to cover a substantial portion of the solar system's communication requirements. Uh, I think I may have one more slide. Yes, that's this one. This is just to illustrate how things might look 100 years from now when we have a rich communications environment uh, and uh, and that uh, <clears throat> it will be simply the norm to assume that the 
you know, uh, solar system internet is in place and there to support uh, any either commercial or scientific missions. I think I may have one more slide. Yes, here we go. Uh, now, some of us, after our enthusiasm uh, for the solar system internet um, blossomed, said, well, what should we be doing now to be ready 100 years from now for uh, the possibility of a mission uh, to the nearest star? And so the nearest star is Alpha Centauri, as all of you know. Uh, and we began doing some uh, computations to figure out what it would actually take to deliver a spacecraft in 100 years' time. Frankly, right now, with the current propulsion systems, it would take <coughs> 76,000 years to get there, which is a little long. And so 100 years would require substantial uh, new uh, rocket engine capability, probably something that would use ion engines, for example, with a very specifically high uh, specific impulse. Uh, but I thought I should take this problem to people who were accustomed to doing really hard computations. So I took it to the Lincoln Laboratory at MIT, and I said, how far away are we uh, for, technically from being able to get a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri and have it collect data and transmit data back to Earth? Well, after they did the analysis, the answer is I'm 53 dB away from being able to do that. And I have a huge you know, a mountain to climb in order to overcome some of the barriers. Let me just give you one example of how tricky this is gonna be. Imagine that you're at Alpha Centauri, you have a spacecraft that's collected data, you wanna transmit data back to Earth. You have to point this thing at where the Earth is going to be 4.3 years from now. And you have to aim it, and remember that even if it's a collimated laser, it's gonna beam spread. So you have to aim it so that it'll hit some part of planet Earth, or at least hit some spacecraft whose orbit you can calculate to pick up that signal. And so this is a non-trivial exercise. We won't get to do this probably for a while, but, it's something to anticipate for the future. So that's the up to the minute uh, report to you on the interplanetary backbone. Uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to report to you what happens when we start engaging with the general public, and I hope with some of you, uh, and perhaps some of you will get interested enough in this to join the Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group. Just go to ipmc.org to see more about that. And now I think we've got some time to chat uh, I'll try to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Vin. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Oh, we, have approx we have approximately 28 minutes uh, to field some questions, and we have five right now. I'm going to read them to you. Okay. Uh, could, you, could you please explain why 28 kbps made people grumpy? Uh, well, it made people grumpy because 28 kilobits a second is not very... Uh, high data rate, and considering the increasing amount of content that the rovers are capable of generating because of the analytics and all of the imagery, I mean, it's, there are a significant number of cameras, for example, on board uh, Perseverance, as, as there were on the other rovers. So 28 kilobits isn't very much. Uh, the uh, excitement right now is optical. Um, and there, I think I mentioned in, uh, in my talk that uh, we've at least done one example of an optical link to the moon and back at 6.2 megabits a second. Of course, the data rates tend to fall off as you go farther and farther away because the signal to noise ratio gets smaller unless you can get the antenna to be bigger or the power uh, signals to be higher. So um, something that is more along the lines of a megabit per second would be extremely welcome. Uh, for uh, for this kind of exploration. Um, and that's why the scientists were grumpy about 28. They were happier with 128, uh, to be honest. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, um, I'm down in my basement and uh, there. These are political calls that come and normally I, oh, God, I can't. These are people asking for uh, for money. Здравствуйте, как вы поживаете? Я говорю не по-английски, ты говоришь по-русски. До свидания. That took care of that. <coughs> uh, I hope everybody gets an amused, uh, some amusement out of that. Uh, it usually works, except for the time when the FBI called, uh, and then I had trouble explaining what was this uh, Russian uh, tvarish business all about. 
Okay, so that's my basic answer. 28 kilobits is too slow. Can you do something faster for me? And we did. Uh, we'd like it to be even faster than that. And optical is the direction to go to achieve that objective. Excellent. Uh, that first question was posted into our PC tool, and I was just copied over. I do not know who uh, sent it. But our next question comes from Jordan Santiago. He uh, he or she asks, I wonder why the round trip times from Earth to Mars is very jittery between seven to 40 minutes. Question. Oh, it's not it's not jittery at all. Uh, it, it's, it's simply a, a consequence of uh, orbital uh, motions of both Earth and Mars. Keep in mind they're in ellipso ellipsoidal, nearly circular orbits around the sun. But since they're not moving at the same speed, Earth is going around in essentially 365 days and uh, Mars is going around in more like 620 some odd days. And so uh, it lags the Earth. And so our distance increases over time and then it decreases after it reaches a maximum. So the nearest uh, approaches are about 35 million miles. The most distant approaches uh, are uh, about 235 million miles and hence the seven and a half minute round trip time when we're closest together and the 20, uh, 40 minute round trip time when we're farthest apart. So it's a continuously varying uh, value for round trip time. Uh, it's not jittery in the, in the sense of jumping back and forth. Okay, Jordan also asks, <clears throat> I wonder if IPv4 or IPv6 being used at all for the CCSDS file delivery protocol. And if they are used, which one is better, IPv4 or IPv6? Well, IPv4 and IPv6 are functionally equivalent. The only essential difference is that v6 has a larger address space. Either one potentially could be used in low latency environments. In high latency environments, uh, it's um, uh, not satisfactory to run straight IP. You have to do something on top of that. TCP would be in insufficient um, because of the, uh, the round trip time variation. Uh, means that the flow control would not work very well. It's a very simple flow control for TCP. So you'd have to run something else uh, that's delay and disruption tolerant over IP. And in fact, uh, because we don't want to apply an IP address space structure across the entire solar system, <clears throat> owing to the fact that the, the um, uh, consumption of IP address space will vary significantly from planet to planet. Uh, I mean, I'm making it sound as if the planets are populated. They're not. But they would have and do have spacecraft that have, we need to communicate with. They will need some kind of addressing capability. But Earth is consuming address space at an enormous rate, partly in consequence of mobile telephony and uh, Internet of Things. And so uh, we concluded that uh, we needed a different addressing structure for the interplanetary system. And so uh, endpoint identifiers in the bundle protocol suite uh, are not either IPv4 or IPv6. The bundle protocol suite could run over IP uh, and could run over IPv6 in low latency um, settings um, because we don't expect to use IPv4 or IPv6 for the high um, latency um, interplanetary environment will use the bundle protocol and the, uh, uh, the glider trans, uh, transmission protocols for that. The other point I would make about addressing is that, um, uh, and I think I made this point earlier, uh, if you're going into a multi-hop interplanetary environment, uh, the last thing in the world you want to do is from the origin point, try to resolve the destination address on the target planet which is what I, the TCP protocols would do um, in order to address a packet over IP. And if you so remember, I mentioned this, that if you do a lookup from Mars, for example, to get an IP address on Earth, uh, you might not get an answer back for perhaps as much as 40 minutes, maybe even more if a retransmission is required. By the time you get the answer back, it's possible that the IP address actually of the target will have changed on Earth because the target might be mobile. So we concluded that the right thing to do is have an endpoint addressing structure, which has two parts to it. Uh, one of them is uh, which planet are you going to or which spacecraft are you going to? And then where, uh, which device on that planet or which device on that spacecraft 
are you addressing? So it's a two part um, addressing structure. And it's only the when you get to the target planet or spacecraft that you do the final lookup to see what identifier to use on that target. So uh, neither IPv4 nor IPv6 would be appropriate for an end to end uh, transmission. Uh, except in a low latency environment. Okay, moving right along. Um, this came from our PC tool as well. Um, this is kind of a previous question. Are we, are we going to have enough IPv6 addresses for an interplanetary network? Well, the implications of my previous answer are that no. Uh, and so we aren't <laughs> going to try to use IPv6 to address the entire solar system, we were thinking, you know, 100 years ahead, that there would be a, at most modest populations on uh, the moon and Mars, uh, possibly only scientific things, uh, maybe if Elon Musk's uh, uh, hopes are, uh, are fulfilled, maybe we will actually have some colonization on Mars, uh, if not also on the moon. Of course, the conditions in, on both places are quite extreme, uh, and so I wouldn't expect the population explosion necessarily. Um, however, we, we just were thinking in general that, um, that the consumption rate of IP address space uh, on Earth would continue uh, undiminished. And so uh, having to share the address space with the rest of the planets just seemed like a mistake, uh, in addition to which the two-part two addressing structure would not be accounted for in the case of, uh, of uh, IPv4 or IPv6. So uh, we would allow, technically, each of the planets to have their own V4 or, in fact, a V6 address space completely separate from and not reachable directly uh, from any of the other planets or any of the other spacecraft. Uh, it gets tricky um, when you imagine a spacecraft going from Earth to Mars, let's say. While you're uh, in, on Earth physically or maybe in Earth orbit, you could be using address spaces that are uh, specific to Earth. As you're in transit uh, and not either near Earth or near Mars, you need another endpoint addressing uh, uh, mechanism. And then when you get to Mars, you need uh, the third one. Uh, so we concluded that we had to have endpoint addressing that takes those scenarios into account. And so we could distinguish between a thing on Earth, a thing that's in solar uh, system space, but not associated with any planet or moon or anything and then a device that's local to one of the planets or one of the moons in the solar system. So the endpoint identifier structure of the bundle protocol suite takes that into account, which IPv4 or IPv6 would not. Excellent. Uh, this last question also came from our PC tool. What skills do you think a network engineer will need to operate an interplanetary network? This is a really, really good question. So thank you for asking that. The first thing that you have to do is to let go of all of your intuition about uh, networks being uh, responsive in, this, in the sense of ping being something that gives you uh, an, an immediate sense of whether the target is alive and well or whether the uh, SMTP uh, network management system is functioning uh, or whether you could have fairly interactive exchanges between network management system and a particular device that's being managed. Uh, the SMTP designs uh, and even the proprietary designs tend to take into account uh, a, a notion of easy interaction, uh, short, uh, low latency interactions to set variables and to gather data uh, or send commands. The uh, situation in, in the interplanetary environment is that the delays are sufficiently high and the delivery is sufficiently uncertain uh, that you need um, a different kind of network management system, which is delay and disruption tolerant. The implication of that is that you're typically going to be sending a chunk of commands to the target, which the command, which the target would then execute autonomously and then respond uh, at, uh, at its convenience. Um, so we have a, a much less interactive kind of design than uh, typical uh, Earth-based uh, internet uh, management systems. Uh, so uh, again, ping is not your friend and the network management system has to be uh, properly configured and designed for uh, a high latency and potentially lossy environment. Uh, and so we've developed a whole new suite of network management protocols that, that 
follow those characteristics and which we hope will uh, serve uh, the need, we'll, uh, we'll be experimenting with it, testing it, first in uh, on Earth and in near Earth uh, environments, including the moon. Uh, and then, of course, as the missions are launched to Mars, we'll be uh, validating those, uh, those designs uh, with those systems and hopefully uh, with other missions that are anticipated between now and, say, 2030 we'll be able to evaluate how well the network management system functions in a relatively dispersed high latency uh, environment. Thank you again. Uh, this next question comes from Matthew Peacock. He asks, how does the interplanetary network deal with time synchronization? And what standard time reference gets used when Greenwich time no longer has local relevance? So, well, Greenwich time is probably, I, I know you're thinking UTC, universal time. Uh, that it is, uh, it actually, there's nothing wrong with UTC, and there's nothing wrong with trying to maintain a standard that's based on UTC. Um, it's simply um, a, a synchronizing uh, mechanism. The, uh, it is correct, however, that time sync is very important because the various spacecraft have to know when they should be transmitting. And so we would, we can use things like the network time protocol or other, others that are similar for purposes of doing time sync. Uh, we would expect to use fairly high resolution clocks. Uh, some of you may know that, uh, that uh, NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, has been developing what in effect is a clock on a chip uh, instead of having you know, a giant uh, atomic clock. So we're reaching the point where we can do uh, these kinds of protocols in spite of the fact that, uh, that the latencies may be very high. You can still achieve Einsteinian uh, synchronization uh, with these systems. Um, so, so that's the, uh, the plan is that we would have relatively high resolution clocks in the spacecraft and on the surface of the planets. We do that today, as you must know, uh, for all of the spacecraft that are in flight and are on the surface of the planets, they have clock resolutions that are sufficient to allow them to know when they should be receiving or when they should expect to transmit. The contact graph system, which is used for routing and timing, uh, has indications as to when uh, a, an antenna needs to be pointed in some particular direction and needs to be either prepared to receive or prepared to transmit. Um, so um, the, the distances that are involved, at least within the solar system, are not so high that we can't maintain clock sync. Uh, when it comes to uh, even larger distances, I'm less clear about that. Um, and I would guess that we would need high resolution clocks that, that we can rely on. Thank you. Our next question is from Keldi Adoni. Keldi asks, does it make sense to switch Earth satellite orbiter rover instead of in and out of Earth station? Would it provide better signal levels by avoiding the attenuation of the atmosphere? So that's a very good question. One of the reasons that we still use the deep space network is that we can build 70-meter uh, dishes, which are honking big uh, antennas. They have very high gain. Uh, when we go outside of the uh, atmosphere, uh, now we're talking about either putting something, for example, on the far side of the moon or putting something in orbit around Earth, uh, which, by the way, has served us well in the Mars case. The orbiters on Mars uh, have uh, more solar power and bigger antennas than the uh, things that we were able to land on the surface. And so transmitting through the orbiting relay uh, uh, turned out to benefit us. We could make a similar argument, I suspect, for um, for uh, collecting signals and sending signals to Mars by uh, using Earth orbiting uh, communications relays as opposed to going all the way back to the deep space net. I will say, however, that the deep space net, uh, because of the uh, antenna game, is an extremely attractive proposition compared with the size of the antennas that we could manage to field uh, in orbit uh, around the Earth. Now, having said that, uh, you know that the James Webb uh, Telescope is a honking big telescope. 
uh, with a great deal of it means physically a very large piece of equipment. So your suggestion is not totally uh, uh, out of line, um, but we would we would need um, a significant uh, size antenna in orbit in order to achieve the same kinds of uh, gain despite atmospheric uh, limitations uh, with the uh, deep space network. Now, when we go to optical, uh, that's a different story, and it's very much uh, likely that we would want to have an orbiting satellite telescope uh, which could receive an optical signal uh, and avoid attenuation through the atmosphere. Uh, so the suggestion is not at all crazy. It's actually probably should be part of our long-term plan. Excellent. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Bartek. TCP, IP, and many other protocols built on top of it that make the internet work are simple and elegant. Sometimes having designs that have that can be created with a pen and napkin. It sounds like these interplanetary protocols are more complex and complete. If the original internet protocols were comparably in complexity, how would that have impacted adoption? And will this complexity impact adoption for interplanetary adoption? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, you're quite right that simplicity has been our friend uh, when it comes to the TCP IP protocol suites. Uh, especially at the IP layer. Uh, the TCP uh, implementations, of course, have evolved over time with all kinds of mechanisms for flow control and buffer bloat management and things of that kind. The bundle protocol suite is not terribly different. Uh, the bundle protocol itself is closer to, uh, to IP, the inter inter uh, internet protocol, in terms of uh, the basic simplicity. Uh, however, as, as I pointed out in my talk, uh, we made one choice that's quite different from the IP case, and that's where we actually store content in the network in order to avoid throwing things away that we work really hard to deliver partway to the destination. Um, I, uh, our implementations of the bundle protocol have not been overwhelmingly more complex than the implementations of the TCP IP suite. Um, they may seem that way because we've incorporated the security mechanisms into the bundle protocol as opposed to layering them on top as we did with TLS. Uh, some of you will know that uh, the QUIC protocol is an alternative to TCP IP, which combines the TCP functions with the end-to-end uh, -end crypto functions, the TLS functions, uh, and also introduces some um, uh, important multi-channel flow control within a uh, a quick uh, connection. So um, I'm not worried that the level of complexity of the bundle protocols is significantly different than the TCP IP or the UDP and IP combinations have been. Uh, and the evidence of that, of course, is that we have multiple implementations of the bundle protocol that are shown to be to work. And once you get to the point where interworking is reliable, um, you can convince yourself that it must not have been overly complex because more than one organization has succeeded in actually writing uh, a, uh, an interoperable instance. Excellent. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Carson. In your opinion, how far has quantum communications with optical come for an interplanetary network? Well, we're nowhere close to being able to maintain uh, a, an entangled state for the uh, time delays that are required. Uh, if it's uh, even in seven minutes uh, or, well, three and a half minutes is actually quite a long time to maintain uh, a quantum entanglement, which is what you need in order to have successful quantum communication. There's work going on with quantum relays. Uh, but again, the interplanetary distances are, ex are really extreme. Uh, and so um, it's not yet clear. I think the, the longest anybody has ever transmitted and received an entangled photon is on the order, of, I want to say, 1,500 kilometers. And Chinese have been going from a ground station through uh, a satellite and then back down to another ground station. Those numbers will get bigger over time, but um, not, not particularly 
uh, attractive for even uh, to the moon and back, uh, which is we're still only talking two and a half seconds of round trip time. Uh, so as excited as many of us have become about the possibility of quantum internet and quantum relays, uh, we're really far, far away from, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, from being able to uh, maintain quantum entanglement long enough for that to be useful. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Doherty. Has there been any thought or planning for voice or video in the bundle protocols as either their own protocol or some type of layered application similar to the existing OSI? So the answer is, uh, first of all, OSI doesn't exist. Uh, OSI is a fantasy. Uh, and not to be overly pejorative, it's a nice architectural description of layering. Um, and, but not to be nitpicky, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we have indeed tested both voice and video with the Bungle protocol. Uh, keep in mind that interactive voice and video doesn't work unless the latencies are fairly low. Uh, and we have been testing uh, the capability of the Bungle protocol to do, for example, multicasting uh, and to do uh, interactive real time when the conditions permit. So, for example, a, uh, a local terrestrial implementation of the bundle protocol uh, can indeed run uh, an interactive uh, and video or audio session. However, when you get far enough apart, uh, so the latencies are high, uh, interaction doesn't work anymore, and you end up basically sending video clips or audio clips uh, along with text as if it were an email. Uh, and, and I expect that will be the primary interaction for any of the deep space missions uh, until such time as uh, subspace radio gets invented by somebody in the 24th century. Thank you. Our next question comes from Leo Vagoda. Yes, how does the network prioritize traffic when a relay has more than its outbound capacity in its store and forward buffer? Yeah, very good question. And we've incorporated into the bundle protocol notions of uh, priority and also notions of expiration. So it's uh, just as in the uh, in the internet uh, where we use hop count for, for, for that purpose, uh, there's a mechanism in the bundle protocol to decide that a particular bundle is no longer useful to be transmitted because its, ex its utility has expired. So we have provision for prioritization within any uh, bundle protocol node uh, and uh, and it, we will also have to figure out how to deal with flow control uh, which is still i would say a work in progress uh, to try to avoid overloading resources in any particular bundle node brian holloway asked a question about ntp and he thanks uh, matt peacock um, for asking it and that you answered it already uh, so moving right along, our next question is from Scott Johnson. Theoretically, then, in the event of a large-scale colon large-scale colonization, an instance of the internet could be implemented terrestrially on Mars. Terrestrially on Mars. So the answer is yes. Uh, if we can implement it on Earth, we could certainly implement it on Mars. It does raise some interesting questions, though, because. The implementations on Earth uh, have taken advantage of a number of uh, uh, technologies and their support structure, for example, fiber optic networks and things of that kind. What isn't so clear is uh, which technologies will be sustainable on Mars, even in the presence of uh, colonization. So it might, might be that, that we have a more limited choice of implementation. It could be that we could use local networking with both radio and maybe even ethernet style things. Um, but you know, we might not be able to use optical fiber to you know, connect any significant portions of Mars together just because of the uh, challenge of implementing that. And so radio and satellite relay might turn out to be more likely uh, for a Mars uh, colonization case, especially if the colonies are scattered apart uh, with some distance between them. I would doubt seriously that we would be able to do a, uh, a Mars-based uh, fiber optic network of the sort that we've been able to implement here on Earth simply because of the challenge of both implementing and maintaining it. Scott also commented, uh, IP address 
uh, collision could be avoided by adding a single bit, uh, defining which internet to route to. When we get three internets, though, we'll have to add another bit. Smiley. Well, I, we would not use the addressing structure. We would keep the networks completely segregated. They would not appear to be uh, interconnected at all. None of them could directly address the others. Uh, which is why we chose the uh, the two-step bundle protocol addressing structure for endpoint identifiers, so as to not conflate uh, IP addressing on Earth with IP addressing on Mars or on, on the Moon or elsewhere, if we choose to use Internet at all on any of those locations. Okay. Uh, our next question is from Gavin McMillan, and we only have about two minutes left. Um, what about asteroid collision? Well, asteroids are a real hazard, and uh, of course that will be true for people going to Mars uh, or further out in the solar system. Uh, so one thing you hope for is that we have adequate tracking of asteroids so that we can avoid uh, collisions. Uh, but they will happen, and some of you may have read about some of the, it's not an asteroid, it was actually just a piece of detritus from other satellites that hit the uh, International Space Station uh, arm, robot arm recently. Uh, so the answer is uh, that's always a potential hazard, and uh, we hope that for any significant size asteroids that, uh, that we would be able to track them. There's a lot of work going on right now to, to identify potential uh, asteroid hazards for Earth. Um, I don't know that uh, there's very much going on for um, other missions, you know, that, that are on their way to the outer planets. Um, but there is a, a great deal of work to track at least some portion of the asteroid belt uh, to avoid uh, uh, trajectories that might, in fact, produce a collision. I'd be worried about uh, coronal mass ejections, too, uh, as another possible hazard. Our last question comes from Jorge Amadella. The question is, is there a simulated test network available for development? Uh, there is a simulation. It's not even a simulation. It's actually a, a laboratory arrangement with, with most of the uh, NASA laboratories and some others of the other space agencies, part of it, what we'll call a DTN bone. Uh, so we're using that to uh, test new versions of the protocols and to put them into uh, simulated environments where we introduce artificial delay and things of that sort. Uh, we are, frankly, also hoping to engage with the general public by putting the protocols into the various cloud operations like Google's Google's cloud and Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft uh, and making those available at least through uh, apps that might run on either a laptop or a mobile uh, to exercise the system and allow us to observe how well it functions at scale if we have a large enough population of uh, terrestrial users uh, to let us uh, push a lot of traffic into the system. So I hope you'll be hearing more about that from the IPN Special Interest Group, IPNSIG.org. Vint, thank you very much for your presentation and your time today to answer uh, some questions and answers. We do appreciate it from the NANOG. Uh, happy, happy to uh, to draw this to your attention. You can uh, you can imagine that this is a whole new uh, environment with, uh, and parametric space in which to think about network operations. So I'm happy to have a chance to sort of jog your your imagination a bit. Thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. See you on the net. <laughs> the question is which one? Thank you. Thank you.